Well, <clears throat> let's get started. It is Sunday, August the 23rd. August is almost over, and the end of the year is coming. Just amazing how fast it's went by this year, even um, with the COVID, the pandemic, and everything, and it seems like some things may have slowed down, but it's amazing how fast the year has went by. I've enjoyed doing these Zoom Sunday school classes. I hope to continue these even when we get back in church full time. And maybe we can continue to share those with people. The title of our lesson today is We Strengthen One Another. The point, we strengthen one another to live as God desires. Our passage is going to come from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 21. That's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 21. In the instructor manual, the Bible Meets Life says, it's dangerous and foolish to lift heavy objects without help. Those who do strength training with weights know the value of a spotter, a person who supports you to do more than you think you can and is quick to intervene or assist as needed. Christians do that for one another. As God works through us, he uses us to strengthen one another in the face of a world that calls us to follow a different path. The setting, in Ephesians ch chapters 4 through 6, Paul dealt in general with the Christian life. He laid out the practical application of the first three chapters, <coughs> theological truths about Christ, salvation, and the church. Chapter 5 addresses how Christians relate to the larger society, the issue of the proper relation of Christians to culture or the church to the world, provided a larger context for discussion of specific issues. At times, Paul's teaching resembled John's instruction about not loving the world or the things in the world, and that's 1 John 2, 15. Now, in the student manual, the Bible Meets Life, <coughs> says this, I was so embarrassed, I was at the gym, but at that moment, I was hardly doing anything productive. I was lying flat on my back with heavy barbells pressing against my chest. No matter how much I tried to push, my arms refused to cooperate. They had even, I'm sorry, they had given up under exhausted protest. I knew the first commandment of strength training and gym etiquette, but I had broken it, and now I sheepishly faced the consequences. Let me let somebody else in here. When lifting weights, always enlist a spotter, someone who both pushes you to persevere and intervenes if your arms give out. Yet here I was, imprisoned by the weights on my chest because I foolishly thought I could do it on my own. I also need a spotter in my Christian life, and you do too. God gave us the church to be that help. Fellow Christians embolden us to persevere, and they intervene when our souls are discouraged and we feel beaten and weighed down by life's troubles. As God's Spirit works through us, He uses us to strengthen one another in a world that calls us to follow a different path. Again, our scripture today is going to come from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 21. And we're using the uh, Christian Standard Bible interpretation. You can follow along in your King James or New King James or whatever other interpretation that you may have. <clears throat> the first question it asks us is, when has someone shown that they really had your back? You know, there's been times for all of us, maybe playing sports, uh, maybe just a friend in life, a Christian friend at church. It just depends on the situation that we're in. But in your life, think about someone who really had your back. <clears throat> Could be a parent. For a lot of us, it was parents, a mother and father who was there to support you even when you were doing really stupid things. 
So it could be uh, anyone at any time in your life, but somebody had your back and, and helped you get through whatever situation that you were in. So <clears throat> God gave us the church and that's where we get our support. That's where we get our strength. And I've mentioned many, many times, and I've mentioned on these Zoom meetings that I need to go to a church building to be with the church. It gives me strength. It helps me be able to, to walk this earth a little easier with a little more confidence because I know that there are people there, one, who share my beliefs, two, who will share in my struggles. So it does help. And, and I encourage you, if you don't have a church family, please find a church family. You can go to a beautiful church building that the church family is just not that good. And that's the only way I know to say it. Uh, some people treat church as an obligation. They treat church as just something that they're expected to do. Well, that's not the way we should be. We should go to a church building to be with the church in order to worship the God that created us, the God that gave us life, and the God that gives us salvation. So as we move into our lesson, our first set of scriptures is going to be Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 14. It says, for, one, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth, testing what is pleasing to the Lord. <clears throat> Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made visible. For what makes everything visible is light. Therefore it is said, get up, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The one question it asks us here <clears throat> in the instructor book, says, how does life in darkness contrast with life in the light? You know, I, I remember taking cave tours and you go into these caves and these little creatures that live in those caves all the time, maybe fish, maybe little crabs, little crustaceans, things like that. And they, um, when you look at them, they, they become, really they become translucent and their eyes change the way that you look at them and the way that you see them, they change. And it's just a different creature that is in the dark, that is in the light. In the light, we see them and they're maybe pink colored, their eyes are black, but in that darkness, they're they're translucent, they lose that, and those eyes become reddish or pinkish. It's, it's, it's different, it's weird. So um, I apologize for all the dogs in the background. My neighbor has some, and I'm on the back porch today. We have the grandkids in the house. I didn't know which would be worse, so we'll listen to dogs barking a little bit. But when we look at this, it, it tells us, it doesn't say, necessarily in verse eight, for you were once in darkness, which we were, it says for you once, you were once darkness, which means that pre-Christ, pre-salvation, our life was darkness and, and our life and our fruits were those things that come from darkness, that are not exposed to the light, those things that we can do in secret, those things that we can sometimes hide from others. And that was our life pre-Christ. But then he, then he goes on to say, but now you are light in the Lord. He said, not necessarily that you are in the Lord's light, which we are, but we are light 
in the Lord. We are part of that life. And, you know, it goes into <laughs> some things here as it discuss what light does. But one thing light does is expose things. And, and we all know this. You know, we have to go, we have to turn on the light at night because it's dark and we want to see, especially if you have small children or grandchildren that tend to want to dump every small little toy that they can find out in your floor so that you find them while you're walking in the dark. They, uh, we want to be able to see. We like to be out in the daytime. A lot of times at night, you know, a lot of people like to be in the light, whether even if you're outside, a lot of times we're drawn to even a street light or something like that. just anything that sheds some light that so we can see what's going on around us so that we can see our environment. And we know that we feel a little bit safer when we're in the light. And, and I think that's the truth here is we feel safer when we're in the Lord's light. So it, then it goes on to tell us, live as children of light. Okay. Well, let me read the next one. It goes on to say in verse 11, don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. So we're supposed to live as children of light. So what, how do we know that someone's living as children of light? Well, one thing we have is in many chapters, I'm sorry, books of the Bible, there are descriptions of fruits of the spirit. And that could be translated also as fruits of the light. But in this particular text, it tells us three things that are fruit of the light, and that's goodness, righteousness, and truth. You know, <clears throat> as we look at truth, well, sometimes telling the truth hurts, and I think we talked about this last week. Sometimes telling the truth is scary. Uh, we don't want to do it. We don't want to expose ourselves, maybe expose our inner feelings. We don't want to do those things. We are scared to do it. We're scared sometimes to live in that light because we know that when we say these things or when we admit to these things or these thoughts or actions that we have done, then everybody's going to know. And maybe we don't want everybody to know, but we have to be truthful, not only with ourselves, but with our fellow Christians. They deserve it and we deserve it. And just like we deserve for them to be honest with us in our, in our dealings, when you do business with someone, you go to buy a used car. You want to deal with someone that is truthful about the vehicle that they're selling. So when I go to, speaking of vehicles, but when I go, if you go to look at a car that someone owns, not at necessarily the car lot, which we, we do, but you know, you go to look at a vehicle that someone owned and it was a one owner vehicle. You know, you want those people to be honest with you. You want them to tell you, uh, yes, I had an accident and, and, you know, I smashed the front fender and it's been repaired or, you know, it, it does burn some oil or whatever. The transmission seems to be slipping a little bit now and again. We want them to be honest with us and they should be honest with us. Uh, in their dealings. So in a Christian wall, I think it's even more so. We need to be honest with each other in our dealings. And if I'm doing something wrong, if I'm doing something that's not in line with the, with the life that I should be living, one, I should be truthful to myself and admit it, but someone out there in our Christian family should speak up and say, hey, you know what you're doing is not right, and there are other people seeing this. So truthfulness, man, that's a huge one. Of course, <clears throat> goodness, 
comes, um, one, I think there's an indwelling spirit in some people to just be good. For others, it's, it's hard. It's something we have to work at. I feel like personally, maybe I'm right in the middle. I, I, I don't always have good thoughts. Sometimes I have, you know, especially in today's environment, it's like I just, you know, want to go out and strangle some people and say, listen, can you not see that the path you're taking, that, that the things you're doing are leading you down a road that you really don't want to be on for eternity? And, and that anger uh, is, is not good sometimes. So, I'm, you know, I have to be careful with what I do. But <clears throat> the, the, the verse 11 again says, don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. Now, there are some things that we need to look at and we need to know that, hey, that is not right. That is not something I should be doing. In a moment, it's going to speak about uh, drunkenness. That's not something that we should we should be in. That's not something we should be partaking of. We need to hold on to whatever that is that that is good, that is right, that is truthful, and avoid those things that that will lead us down the road to hell. But it, instead, it didn't just say don't participate, just avoid them, and go on about your business. It doesn't just say that. It says, but instead, expose them. So that's an action. That's something that we're supposed to do. That's something that we're supposed to take on ourselves to, to stand up and call what's wrong, wrong, and say what's right is right. And, and that's another place in this world where we're starting to see that, that change by leaps and bounds and, and people are running. And it told us this. It told us this in scripture that there would come a day when wrong became right and right became wrong. And that's where we're at. That's what we're seeing in our society. So we have to still be that light. We have to be that city on a hill that it talks about, that, that light that people want to want to be drawn to. We have to be different from the world in our actions and our thoughts and the words that we speak. We have to be different. And we have to expose those things that are wrong. Now, I'm not telling you that you should go to everybody you see that's doing something wrong and just point your finger at them and lambaste them about the, the, the things that, that they're doing that are not in line with Christ. We don't need to do that. Um, some people may respond to that, but more often than not, they become very defensive and, and they don't accept your criticism that well. But we do need to figure out a way to talk to them and we need to figure out a way to relate to them. And we need to try to understand why maybe they're doing the things that they're doing. And remember, there was a time in your life at some point that you lived a more sinful lifestyle. And I say that because we all still sin. But <clears throat> there were a time in our there was a time in our life when we lived a more sinful lifestyle. And we have to be someone that those people who are still there can look at and go, how did you change? What changed you? What caused you to make these decisions? You know, we have, uh, well, I'll talk about that in a moment. And then it says, for it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. There are some things that, man, we just don't need to talk about because if we talk about them, if we, if we contemplate things, if if we're sitting around with, uh, if I'm sitting around with a group of guys and, and, and a beautiful woman comes in the room or walks by and, and I start talking about, boy, she, you know, she's beautiful and, you know, if she were mine and these things like that, I'm planting a seed in my brain and, and that seed might take hold and that seed might cause me to do things that I don't need to do. 
So we have to be careful about even the things that we talk about in secret because we don't want to allow those seeds to grow and to bloom and blossom. And, and we need to be careful. So watch what you say. Stay on guard all the time because Satan is trying to plant that seed in you. Everything exposed by the light is made visible. For what makes everything visible is light. Again, we know about light. We know that sometimes, you know, you've lost something underneath your bed <coughs> or you, you've lost something and maybe it's underneath your bed and uh, you have to go get that flashlight, that pen light, some kind of phone light, I guess is what a lot of us use now, your phone light to shine up underneath that bed because even the the light in your bedroom is not an all-encompassing light. There are still shadows and things hidden in darkness. Well, Christ's light, God's light, is not like that. When God's light shines upon you, everything is in light. There is nothing left about you that is in darkness. He knows it all. It's not like that bedroom light where we still need to go get some kind of supplement to look for things. So he's going to expose it. He's going to expose that sin in your life at some point if you do not get a handle on it. All right, let's move on to our second set of scriptures. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. Pay careful attention, then, to how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. A couple of questions that I ask us is one, how might we be tempted to misuse time? And another one is what practices help you make the most of your time? So what, what things what did it, how did it ask, how might we be tempted to misuse time? You know, it mentions one thing in our study guide, social media, man, social media, golly, at all the different social media platforms that are out there, you can't keep up with them all, and, uh, but we, you know, most of us are familiar with, say, Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram or Yammer or I guess this new TikTok thing that I haven't gotten in on. But whatever it is, there are so many ways and so much opportunity to waste time. We have to be careful about what we do with our time. Most of us, if we even spent a 20 20%, 20% of the time that we were spending on some kind of social media platform on studying and reading the Bible and understanding God's will, it would drastically change our life. But we get caught up in, in, in things. And uh, I will admit, I, I, I just haven't really gotten caught up in it. I, I don't, I have a Facebook account that I tried to start for my business, as most people know, but uh, it just never, I just don't get into that. I don't get into sharing what I'm doing every day and every moment. Uh, I will get on it every, like Facebook, I will get on there every probably two, three or four days and uh, maybe scroll through the first 10 posts that are on there, check my notifications to make sure nobody has tried to get in contact with me. And, and then I get back off because I'll just be honest, very little that's on there interests me. Uh, Instagram and Snapchat are, are two of the other ones that I created accounts in order to keep up with other things. But, you know, I don't know that I've ever made a post. Uh, but there are other ways that I waste time and, and, and I'm just talking about social media there, but there are other ways that I waste time that I could be doing something else that would be leading me closer to Christ, closer to God. And I need to focus on those things. And I think a lot of us do that. We don't need to allow Satan to steal our time. And that's what he's doing. 
he's giving us other things to distract us. He's giving us other things that will keep us from doing what we need to be doing, which is maybe making that phone call to a friend to say, how are you doing? You know, is there anything I can do to help you or studying your Bible or reading some type of commentary that someone has written about the Bible or coming to Sunday school class? There's a lot of people out there that still amaze me uh, in our church. And I'll use our church as an example because uh, everybody on here is on there, but um, it still amazes me the, the number of people we can get in the worship service versus the number of people that will get up and just come to church 45 minutes earlier for Sunday school to get that more personal interaction, to get that more basic understanding of what the Bible is. Uh, for a lot of people, if they could just do it for a month, just do it for four Sundays. I think that it would be easier to make it a habit. And that's what we do is we make the wrong things habits. So I encourage you to, to look at the things that are, that you're doing that might be stealing time away. And I'm not telling you not to do social media, go back to that. You know, Facebook for a lot of people is a great way to keep up with family it's a great way to still connect with people maybe you haven't seen in years from another town or something like that. I think you all can see my grandson standing there at the door staring at us. And uh, I love that little knucklehead. But, uh, but, he, uh, but we need to do those things and, and, and making most of the time the days are evil. That's telling us, there's two words it says that were in the Greek language uh, that denoted time. One of them was a more general sense of time, like a calendar type time, where we get our, our word chronological from, or we get the word chronic. So we have people with chronic illnesses, so that's over a long period of time. But there's another one that they use to denote a more specific time. Uh, in your life, and that's the one that 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 Paul used here was the one that was the more the more specific time in your life. So the more specific time is one, the moment that you got saved, the moment that you confessed your sins and asked Christ into your life to be your Savior. That is a very specific time. Now, with that being said, it also denotes make the most of the time you have because once we're Christians, we should realize that we really truly will not live forever. Sinful people, people in the world, they really have no connotation of the end of life. I really truly think that they just think they're going to go on forever and that's it. But we shouldn't have that same thought process. We should be able to move forward knowing that the end of time is coming, that Christ's return is coming, and we need to spend our time getting prepared for eternity. We need to spend our time getting ready or helping others get ready, helping our church family get ready for the end of time and Christ's return. And it says, don't be foolish. You know, uh, there's one part in the Bible, you know, it tells us we really shouldn't uh, call people fools. But here he is telling us not to be foolish, which is just telling us basically, if you know that there is a Christ and you're, you're saved, and we shouldn't just live our life not studying, not learning, not witnessing in some form or fashion to others. We should be able to, we should spend our time helping others grow closer to Christ, helping others come to Christ. We've got about eight minutes left here, so move on to our third section. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, 
singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. So in the first part, we'll, we'll get the, we'll talk about the elephant in the room. He tells us not to get drunk with wine because it leads to reckless living. So it was common practice in those days. It was common practice even in what we consider in America, the, the Western days, that they did partake of alcohol. And one of those reasons, even in this day, was because alcohol was a clean drink because of the way it was prepared. You couldn't always get clean, fresh water that was suitable to drink. So uh, it, was, it was used in those, it was used in certain ceremonies, and alcohol is just like money. Alcohol in and of itself is not sinful. Money in and of itself is not sinful. There are other things that in and of themselves are not sinful. What happens is, is we allow those things to take control of our life and it becomes simple. It becomes one, an idol in our life. Two, it becomes something that if, if I'm drunk and people are seeing me drunk, they go, well, look at old Gary there. You know, he goes to church and all of these things and look at him now. And it leads them away from Christ instead of toward Christ, which is not. So getting drunk is a sin. It tells us that right here. It, re it leads to reckless living. It leads to us doing things that are stupid. And that's what it's telling us. Just like getting in our day behind the wheel of a car and driving down the road. Now, another time that it mentions that alcohol is a sin is if you're in the presence of someone that uh, does not, they are what we call teetotalers. They just do not believe in partaking of alcohol. So if I'm in the presence of them and I don't necessarily have a qualm with taking a drink of alcohol, but I do it in front of them, then I just committed a sin. So, you know, alcohol is one of those things, just like money or other things, that can that can be misused and abused that lead to bad things in our life. Now, let's move on. Let me see how much time. I got five minutes. He says, but be filled by the Spirit. You know what? Uh, we went to my son's church last night. He preached a sermon, and but the preacher there, you know, the the main pastor, he was you know, let the Holy Spirit come in. Let the Holy Spirit ru rule your night tonight. And those things, if we let that Spirit get inside of us and we allow that Spirit to work in us, we develop a happiness. We develop an energy that we can't develop on our own. We, we just can't. It gives us a, a new purpose. It gives us a new outlook on life. And if we just allow it to take over, think of all the good that we really could do. Speaking to one another in Psalms, which could have referred to Psalms, the book, the ones that they had at that time, uh, the Jews, the Jewish people, hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. It's just saying, spend our time doing things that draw us closer to God and not things that draw us further away from God. Um, you know, some people use that as, as a, uh, a preaching against secular music, maybe country music or whatever other secular music that you listen to or has been. And I don't necessarily believe that. There are some good songs out there that are in the secular world that, that truly, you know, are, are good for you. Uh, a lot of them maybe are love songs where, you, where they're expressing a love to somebody. And that, you know what, that's okay. Uh, but uh, we don't need to allow those things in uh, that, that would draw us further away. Country music today is getting away from that. I tried to listen to some the other morning while I was riding, and it's just terrible. Uh, a lot of rap music, a lot of rock songs. I mean, it's just it's getting bad. 
uh, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. And that's not saying to be plumb, totally scared to death of Christ. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that we do need to have a healthy fear. And again, as mentioned prior to, it's the same healthy fear that you have from a loving father or mother. You know if you do something wrong, that loving father and mother will blister your behind. Now, I'm not saying beat. I'm saying discipline. So, you know, we have that fear of doing something wrong based upon that. We should have the same fear of doing something wrong based upon the fact that Christ is always watching us. And that little voice in the back of our head should tell us, hey, do not do these things. All right, live it out. How might God use you to strengthen others in his church? And how might you allow his church to strengthen you? Identify your own sins through prayer and introspection. <laughs> Identify recurring sins and temptations that weigh you down. Confess those things to God and ask him to bring others into your life to strengthen your walk. Influence others. As you experience strength and victory in your own life, look for opportunities to influence others by being a selfless and submissive member of your church. Ask someone to help you. Invite another Christian or group of Christians to be a part of your fight against temptation. Confess your temptations to them and allow them to confess theirs to you. Stand together against those struggles. God employs his spirit and his people to Strengthen us against the ways of the world. Let us stand strong in the power in which we have been given. And that's true of where we're at right now in our society, in this entire world, but especially here in America where so many factions have developed and there's so many people that are, that are doing their best to widen those gaps so that they can obtain power or stay in power and so their goal is not to bring unity, although that's what a lot of them say, that we're just trying to bring unity. We're just trying to get people to all get along. They're not. Their goal is to keep people divided, and that keeps them in power. So don't allow yourself to be tempted. Don't allow yourself to be drawn away from God, from Christ by the things of this world and the mentality of this world. I appreciate all of you who have been on today and those that were on and have dropped for whatever reason. And I hope that those of you who are listening or watching later on, find a church if you're not already in a good church building, in a good church family, and go be with them on your Sundays and your Wednesdays and other dedicated times that you may have. All right, I'll see some of you at church here in a little while. Thank you. Have a great Sunday.